Welcome to the C2FO webinar. We're really excited to have Eric and Chris. I'm Erin Crow with C2FO, and I'm going to be your host today. Um, as you know from the invitation, we're going to cover COVID, the labor market, supply chain issues, inflation increases, and recent events that are impacting the global economy. We're also going to look at data that illustrates these imbalances and discuss possible disruptors and solutions. Because of the number of attendees in the session, your respective microphones have been muted. If you have questions at any time during the course of this webinar, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of the application window. Our presenters will make an attempt to address your questions during the presentation. And if time allows, they'll also address questions that have been submitted at the end of this uh, webinar. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. And Chris already introduced himself, but it is my pleasure to welcome Chris Atkins, the Senior Vice President of Capital Finance for C2FO, who will introduce Eric, the Vice President of Research and Fixed Income from UMB Bank. We are looking forward to both Chris and Eric's perspectives on how companies of all sizes are responding to the uncertain economic climate. Chris, I give you the floor back. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. That was much better than I was going to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, you know, the intro to Eric is, is effectively that uh, we've done this. I think this is Eric and I's third, but he's done this six, eight times, something like that with, uh, with C2FO. And uh, uh, we're, we're very close with him in terms of economic research. He leads economic research over at UMB uh, and just uh, frankly, just has a really great mind about these things. And so what we're going to try to do here today is, uh, you know, talk through some slides that Eric has uh, prepared and, and is uh, just has tons of knowledge on. And he and I are just going to try to make this kind of conversational, right, uh, around around things. And so I'm going to keep um, uh, attention on the uh, the Q and A in the chat and try to intersperse those. So if you have if you have a question that pops up uh, from a slide or or even a past slide, you know, I'd love to help weave that in to get your questions answered. Uh, and obviously, we have you know a ton going on right now. You know, Aaron mentioned uh, just a, a you know kind of a an excess of things to talk about, and Eric has some really great and uh, thought provoking uh, 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 kind of experience and uh, and views here. So um, I think that's it. So let's let's go ahead and get started, Eric. And um, please again use that that Q and A in that chat so that we can uh, we can get all your your questions and, and thoughts uh, intertwined in here. So Eric. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, we'll get it launched. And, and as always, Chris, just interrupt whenever something comes up, just barge in and shut me down. We, we, we've had a, a nice uh, presentation cycle going throughout the first quarter this year that we call the Great Balancing Act, because there's a lot of interesting things that our leaders are trying to balance right now to keep this whole uh, train moving. And obviously, it just got a whole bunch more interesting just in the last week or two. So uh, we've jammed in some talk about the Ukraine in here as well. So don't worry, we will get to that. Um, the Ukraine is going to impact a number of these things. So we will definitely have a section on that. I'll get ripping in. Um, Chris will interrupt whenever uh, the questions come up that we want to uh, barge in with. But we got a bunch of imbalances that, that everyone is struggling to deal with right now. And we'll talk about what those are and what maybe the solutions are to all those imbalances. Um, most of the people on this call are grappling with all of them in their personal lives right now. So hopefully it'll strike a chord with everybody. And we'll finish up with our forecasts uh, with what we think is gonna happen. And in particular, have those forecasts changed uh, in the last say two or three weeks, given everything that's going on, because uh, things are interesting. Even just a month ago, is like you could not give this presentation without talking about COVID. Um, things have definitely gotten a lot better. And I think everybody's probably feeling that. It just seems to be tapering off pretty quick. Um, the data certainly show that. This is a, a common chart, the seven-day rolling average of cases um, in the United States. And we know what happened. Omicron went way up, but then it's come way, way, way down. And it's tapering off pretty rapidly. Um, the death rate, which is the ugly part of it, this is a seven-day rolling average there. It follows behind the case, the case rate always, and it has certainly rolled over, and it's definitely expected that it's going to plummet back down too. And it, it just it looks like this thing is getting into our rearview mirror. Question is always, well, what about the next one? What about the Zeta variant or whatever it is? What's coming down the pike? Um, probably, yeah, there, there, there probably is. Is it going to be gone from our lives forever? No, it would be silly to say that. But what we do know is that with each one of these waves, with the, the first wave back in 2020, and then we had the alpha and the delta and the Omicron, they seem to get less and less deadly. 
I think everyone has picked up on that. The death rate associated has gotten less and less deadly. Omicron was a lot more contagious, but dramatically less deadly than the previous waves. And we all seem to have been gotten better and better and better at just dealing with it in our lives. So even as the next one comes along, Zeta or whatever it is, we're confident that we're going to be even better at, at just moving along with our lives and having it disrupt us as little as possible. So we think the COVID story has definitely gotten better. And the data that we would look at to confirm that shows up for sure, like in consumption and consumer confidence. Confidence is the first thing that's on the screen right here. You can see confidence, it always drops during a recession. That's what the gray bar is here on the screen, but it's climbed right back up out of there and has come up very nicely to 110.5 when we put this slide together. Some folks go, hey, it's, it's not where it was in 2018. Um, these numbers we had in 2018 and 19, these 120s, 125s on the consumer confidence index, those were astoundingly high numbers. Those were unsustainably high numbers. So even just getting back to 110.5, that's a very, very good number for confidence. So it's not as high as it was in 18 or 19, but it's still very, very strong. So it's telling us consumers feel pretty darn good about things. And it definitely shows up in the most important thing for us as business people is consumption. Um, and consumption is very, very strong. You can see it dropped off during the recession as it had to. It rebounded very rapidly and it hasn't just come back to 2018 or 19 levels. It's come way back above that, trillions of dollars higher than where we were in 18 or 19 in terms of consumption. So it's all the way back and it's way, way in the positive. So um, all these things are telling us that, that despite the ongoing waves, we are dealing with it better and our consumption behavior is well above where it was before this whole uh, COVID thing jumped into our lives. So as disturbing as it is, we're dealing with it and the economy is just marching forward. So that's a good thing. Um, Eric, Eric, on yeah. that last slide, are you, are you seeing any correlation uh, between, you know, we obviously had uh, unprecedented stimulus, uh, which, you know, I think we're going to talk a bit about inflation, uh, either kind of inflation adjusted or, um, you know, kind of stimulus adjusted uh, spending. And is there any concern that you're seeing there or is that, uh, should we? It's a really, really good question because we all know that stimulus had a big role in this. Um, Five trillion dollars went out the door as soon as we, as soon as this crisis hit in waves, up to five plus trillion dollars went out the door. Um, it certainly did not hurt consumption at all. The big question is, and you, you'll hear economists grappling with it, is is we know that there's about five trillion dollars of excess savings parked on the sidelines in the United States. And so they will say, did it really actually flow out the door into consumption? Maybe mm. not. It might have just built up in savings. So did it, did it really stimulate anything? It's a really kind of a raging question right now amongst the academics and the economists, because certainly it helped keep people's confidence up for sure. But we know there's been a massive buildup of savings along with it. So, And we'll look at those charts uh, here in a second to show that because it's a little bit murky as to, as to how much stimulus it really did for consumption. Um, we know that we've got a problem with the labor force. That is a big imbalance. Everybody on this call is feeling it. Um, if you are involved in the business world at all, you know there's a labor problem out there. And there's a couple of different ways to illustrate it. The, the big thing that people focus in on is this thing called the labor force participation rate. And it's people of working age how many of them are participating in the labor force? Are they either working or they're looking for work? Um, and it took a big drop off, you can see right here, uh, on, and during this last recession, much more so than is typically the case because we shut the world down. Uh, we haven't done that in any other previous recessions and it hasn't rebounded all the way back up. You can see on here, there's, a, there's more than a 1% difference between where we were and where we are now. And that's several million people. That's three or 4 million bodies that were working in 2019 and are not working now and are of working age. And so, you know, the trend line was down because of population aging. Um, as we get older and older as a populace, the percentage of thus uh, of adults in the workforce is going to drop off. We broke way below that. Now, you would point out we've come back up to where that trend line was. So maybe we don't make any more gains from here because we were kind of on this path anyway. Um, and there are folks arguing about whether we are going to get back to call it 63%, which is, is where we were for several years before all this happened. And that's a few million people. And it's really, really important. Um, this 62% number we may be stuck with for a while. And if so, that means we're going to have a labor challenge for quite a while. Um, 
everyone knows hard to keep people, real hard to find people if you have spots. Um, yeah, it gets. That's, that's right. Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I guess you're you're hopping into it, but we're in our prep. You know, you talked about kind of a rate that you were uh, you would start to get alarmed at, right? So it's 62. I mean, it's, you could look at this chart and say, "Holy cow, we went from you know 67 to 62." You know, kind of, and and then what we're feeling with the dislocation that you're about to talk about. You know, kind of the world's on fire. At what point do you get really concerned uh, from a macro perspective um, on yeah. the uh, participation rate? If we, if the, if the broad participation rate, which is one on the screen here, just, this is for everybody, the whole, the whole adult population, if it had stayed below 62, we would have had a really serious problem. Mm -hmm. If we don't get back to 63, it's going to still be a problem, but it should be manageable. Um, it should be manageable. Another per half a percent or percent lower is another three or four people missing from the workforce. That would have been a very serious problem. We got stuck down here at 61 and a half. Um, it, it would have been a real, real serious problem. And what it would have caused was just a lot more inflation and backlogs and, yeah. and all those kind of things. We seem to be working out of that with what just the recovery we've made in the last six months. We seem to be working out of it. So if we drop back down to 61 and a half, there's a problem. Houston, there will be a problem for sure. Um, and it, it really is a story of, you know, there's demographics inside there. Um, there's a thing called the prime working age, and that's people 25 to 54. That, that's what they've, they've always considered the prime working age, the people that work the most and, and tend to earn the most income also is 25 to 54. Um, and you can see on this chart, it's recovered, but again, it's a full percentage point below where it was. Um, we were at 83% of 25 to 54 year olds. Now we're at 82. Um, it certainly has steadily gotten better. We've climbed our path out from 81 to 82, which is a good thing. Um, and it's getting a, the, the thing that has a lot of people scratching their heads is um, above 55. And we've had a big drop off there. It has recovered a little bit lately which is uh, after it was really sideways for about a year. And then we've had a little bit of a spike. We're still at 39% and we were well above 40 before. They're not confident that this one's going to change too much more because they know that about one and a half million people in that 55 and older age group early retired. So people below 65, above 55, early retired. And they, those folks um, – tend to not come back into the workforce and they may stay out. So this number may be stuck here at 39. It may not improve much from here. Um, we need it to happen in the younger cohorts actually to solve this issue. Um, so does that, that mean, yeah, does that mean that we're, we're seeing, you know, a lot of folks kind of delaying college graduation or going on to a master's and not joining that sub 25 group, right? Cause you got 1% off of, um, cause I think we went from, uh, was it pre kind of 65% uh, down to 62? So are we still missing, you know, one-ish percent? Is it more acute for the under 25 group? It, it hit the under, 10, under 25 group really, really hard yeah. um, for, for sort of the obvious reasons. Um, the mm -hmm. biggest amount of job losses by far, and the ones that are still in place, where the jobs are still missing and the unfilled spots um, is in the services industry. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and we all see it restaurants, bars, those types of places, still really, really difficult to find workers. They're still very, very understrapped. That also hits that under 25 group, that 16 to 25 group gets hit really, really hard there. They were the first people cut and they might be the last people back because services are the last thing that we're feeling comfortable going back to. But the hope is there also that that is changing pretty rapidly right now. Um, the reports for like open table uh, reservations for in, in, in restaurant dining, not for carryout, open table reservations have recovered dramatically in the last two months. So it looks like people are moving back out and starting to fill up those places that require a lot of services. So hopefully those folks in the, that 16 to 25 group or just in the service provider category are ready to go back to work. Um, it's been kind of a slow movement. And one of the reasons you hit on it before, Chris, is if you if you distribute five trillion dollars and the average person gets six or seven or eight thousand dollars that they get to put in their checking account, well, they can live for a few months on that. And they do believe that a lot of folks in that category have said, you know, I got my last check in whatever October. I've got an extra four or five, six thousand dollars in my checking account. Well, I can wait till March or April to go back to work. 
in addition to my other savings. And so maybe they're just waiting a little bit longer to go back because they had a little bit of extra cash flow. So we'll see. Uh, but the demand is certainly rising quickly on the services side, which is a good thing. And it creates um, it creates this crazy thing that, that we'll show you here. This is job openings versus the number of people available to fill those jobs. And this is this first white line here is the chart of job openings, un, unfilled jobs in the United States. And you, you see it just skyrocketed. Uh, we're at basically, we'll call it 11 million people unfilled jobs right now in the United States. And you overlay that with the number of people that are, are willing to work and are looking for work. Well, that's 6.3 million. There's a gigantic gap there. Um, usually the relationship is the opposite in this country. Most of the time there are more unemployed people than there are available jobs. That's why they're unemployed because there's not a, as many jobs as there are people looking for work. That's the traditional relationship in our country. But now we have this flip-flop where there's almost twice as many unfilled jobs as there are people to fill them. And some of that is those 3 million people that left the workforce. They're not unemployed. They're not in the workforce at all. So if you get two of the million of those people, 3 million of those people back in the workforce, that closes this gap pretty dramatically. Uh, but this gap is like nothing we've ever seen before. Our, our country's mm -hmm. never been in a situation like this. Yeah, this is this is really bizarre, right? For those that that maybe are tuning into economic, uh, you know, macro discussions like this for you know the first time or or recently, this is really bizarre, right? Because typically, like like Eric was saying, you normally go through a recession and it, and this is uh, flipped. I think what this speaks to is that we as uh, you know uh, business managers and and uh, and owners really need to be thinking through, you know, there's some talent out there, um, you know, and some talent you could, you know, that's already employed. <clears throat> but what we need to be thinking about is, you know, how do we, how do we upskill, retrain, things like that? Uh, because uh, there's just, the, the people aren't there, right? Even if all 6 million took jobs today, we would still have 4 million left over. So this is, this is weird. Yeah. It's, it's a real deal. Labor is scarce. And um, the, the challenge is, is um, everyone's feeling it. it. We all have to pay up. And it's just, it's happening everywhere to everybody. So two good questions in the, in the chat, Eric. Um, do, do the uh, job openings or the, do we count contractors in this, right? So if somebody went from, you know, a, a services-based uh, employment, you know, where they were a W-2 and then they went to drive for Uber, uh, is that included in... They are employed. The, the, and okay. this is one of the interesting things about um, the, the blue line, the unemployed. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to report yourself as unemployed. You have to consider yourself to be not working, but looking for work. Now, if you had a way to gather your wages without any W-2 wages and you wanted to continue to report yourself as unemployed, um, maybe you might be able to fudge the numbers, though. But your typical contract worker is going to be employed, according to the normal definition. Yeah, just they, they would just call that self-employed, right? Like yep. it's, you, you employ yourself. Okay. And yep. then uh, another another good question. Uh, have we ever seen an inverse relationship like this, right? Where you have this dislocation? Nope. I mean, if you look, this is two full economic cycles on this chart. You go this all the way back to the tech bubble in 2001. And we came out of that recession. There were more unemployed than, 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 uh, than job openings. And that was through the entire business cycle. And then we hit the next recession, the great financial crisis. That relationship stayed the same. There were more unemployed people than there were job openings, which is typically the way it works. And then just recently, you can see here in 1819, it had flipped for the first time, just gently flipped. It. And so we, but you know it, everybody on the call knows it. There was a skilled labor shortage already in 2018, 19. Mm -hmm. If you needed computer programmers, any type of skilled labor at all, you could, it was really hard to find them. So we had a weird imbalance leading into it. And now the imbalance has just been exacerbated really dramatically. So this is something that's happened in the last five years, kind of a, a small labor shortage into a really large labor shortage. Um, and it's a new thing for us. It's a challenging thing. And it leads to, I'm telling you, it drives right to this next slide, which everyone knows about. It, it pushes wage inflation straight up and everybody's dealing with it. It gets led by this thing that's on the top here called the quits rate. Um, this is the number of people each month that voluntarily leave their job. And it's presumed that they voluntarily leave their job to go to a better job. That's, that's how this normally works. And you can see it normally runs around 2% in the United States. And in the recessions, it goes down. And then it pulls itself back up to about 2 It went down and now it's skyrocketed up to 3 So 3% of the workforce is leaving their job every month. That's, that's a big 
big number in the United States. We've never seen anything like that. And it drives right into wage increases. This is one of a bunch of them. The employment cost index is one that people like to follow. Typically runs around 3% in the United States. After the great financial crisis, it dropped down to two and it just worked its way back up to three. And then now it's shot up to 4%. And that's even higher now since we printed these slides. So, you know, when there's a huge labor shortage, pay up to keep them, pay up to find them. And it pushes through to all those other, um, those, all those other inflationary challenges that we have. And you know, Real quick on that. So I think last time we had talked about, there was a, a level at which you would get quite concerned on the employment cost index uh, yep. increase. I think there. four and a half. Okay. All right. So there, you get above four. Trend, above, tro- yeah, that's, yeah. it's concerning. I mean, I think, you, you know, you're looking at one of the things that we're seeing within the C2FO market is that just on, you know, from a macro level, uh, we're seeing inflation that's above the 7%. Now we're a little bit heavier on retail, but we think we're seeing kind of 10-ish percent, you know, year over year when we, when you just look at, you know, the invoices that are loading. Uh, we think we've, we've done a good job of kind of stabilizing that, but, you know, obviously wages are, are doing a lot there, right? And so yeah. problem. And I, I don't know uh, how everybody on the call deals with it, but I know I, I talk to um, our bank advisory boards every quarter. We have five of them and it's probably, I, I don't know the exact numbers, probably a hundred business owners from around our region, um, call it river to mountains region. Um, virtually 100% of them have said they have a very serious wage pressure situation on their hands. Uh, they're having to pay up hard to keep anybody they have, but they also say they're just passing it along now, which is new. Mm-hmm. And that's how it's showing up in what you're seeing. They're passing it right on out now, and it's going out to the consumers and all their clients. Uh, and so it's really starting to be passed through. And that's why everybody's really feeling it now. During those, those couple of years before all this happened in 17, 18, 19, we were all getting hit with it. And our wage, our, our keeping, all, keeping people was getting more and more expensive, but we were eating it. We weren't passing it on yet. Now, in this cycle, everyone's passing it on because it, 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 you can only sacrifice margin for so long. And that's right. why we're seeing this broad-based inflation. I, I tried to buy a pair of shoes. Um, I went to the store. Uh, I didn't like what I saw. This literally happened over three days. Tried a couple of things. I went back to the same store. 20% increase while I was gone over those three days. From that particular manufacturer, uh, in one day, everything had gone up 20% when I went back. So those things are happening. Um, yeah. it's, so the promo. Sorry, last thing on this. So from a sociology, I mean, this is probably unfair because it's more sociology, but in past, it feels like everybody tries to kind of tamp down, uh, you know, inflation, right? You know, kind of have gatekeepers in the supply chain or, you know, uh, as it goes from raw material to ultimate consumer. It feels like we're, we're all just kind of more permissive here, right? We, we understand the task at hand. Uh, and, and so it feels like what we're seeing within the supply chain is that uh, suppliers are saying, hey, look, Raw materials are up, and and so therefore we need to increase our prices. And buyers are generally saying, like, we get it, we understand. Does that does that yeah. make you feel like you could run away a whole lot easier than in in cycles past? Uh, it's it's an excellent point. Everybody gets it. Very few people are pushing back. You know, you always just push back. I'm not going to take those price increases. There was always another vendor that you could turn to, and now there's right. nowhere to hide. There's, there's absolutely not, right. nowhere to hide, and everybody knows it. So yeah, that's why it gets the Fed's attention. And yeah, that's why they start seeing these six and seven percent inflation prints that show up, you know, just in the big public media. Um, it gets their attention. That's how you get inflation goes from three to four to five to six to seven in three, four, five months, which is exactly what's happened because yep. uh, nobody is pushing back because nobody can. Um, you got to close some of these supply chain issues before anybody. You got to have a vendor that can beat that price, and right now nobody can, and so it, it starts to feed. Um, gets their attention for sure. You say, well, what do, what do they do? What do we do? What does everybody do? Well, the first thing is to pull back on the big, big stimulus dollars, which they have. Uh, there's not trillions flying into everybody's pockets anymore. That should help. Um, eventually, those folks that have chosen not to work are going to have to work. At some point in time, you know, 4 million people can't just leave the workforce and say, I'm never going back. Everything's great. Uh, they'll, they'll get back there at some point. So that'll help. The harder part of it is, is do we just have to come in with heavy duty autom- you know, automation and technology to just replace the workers and replace the jobs? There's going to be a lot of that. And the push is going to be pretty frantic. Both, you know, We all see it in the stores. It's going to be a big push there because that's where a lot of those service workers disappeared. They're not there anymore. They're talking about that even in restaurants now. And even in things on the supply chain side, like you know, do we, do we rush through 
uh, the allowances on um, self-driving cars, like maybe trucks, because we all know there are no truckers and there's not going to be any. No one is getting in that pipeline to fill that void. And so technology is going to probably have to be brought online faster now to, to basically eliminate a lot of these jobs where they can't find people. Um, so it's going to bring forward some of these trends that have been in place for yeah. a long time. And from an operator's perspective, to try to kind of land this for uh, for those of you, you know, on the call that are uh, maybe not uh, ec economists, but rather you know trying to run a business, you know, I think we just we need to embrace technology where we can, right? Uh, it, you know, and that looks different for for you know different folks. Like we, you know, Eric and I were talking about, you know, there's uh, at fast food restaurants now there's you know fry cooks that are robots. Uh, you know, there's obviously, you know, automation that can occur even on a desktop through, you know, uh, like robotic uh, process automation. Um, but it, I think it also, it, it should drive, uh, you know, those of us that are leading teams and such, you really got to be mission oriented, right? I think that, you know, uh, especially skilled labor can be very selective at this point. And so, uh, especially, you know, millennials and, and Gen Z, they're much more mission oriented. So where you, you're doing a great job of training and upskilling and getting people up to speed and getting, you know, a uh, career opportunity, and then also uh, kind of uh, connecting their work to a, a greater good, I think you're going to have a lot more uh, uh, success with labor. Yeah, it's going to be critical. It's going to be critical because it's it, there's not a real quick solution on skilled labor right. uh, and filling the gap. There just isn't one. It's easier to fill the gap on the lower end than it is in skilled, for sure. Um, we'll go pretty quickly through um, some of the things that have really been driving the demand part of it. We all know that there's a labor challenge. Uh, the labor challenge is, is exacerbated because there's this huge demand problem. Uh, it's, it's kind of weird to call healthy demand a problem, but right now it sort of is. Um, and you were touching on this earlier. One of the big things is uh, driving all of it is just this liquidity. The, the Fed created $5 trillion in excess liquidity, and th this is what's called M2. But this is money right now that is in checking accounts, savings accounts, money market balances, um, both commercial and in personal, they printed about five trillion, and lo and behold, this line shifted up by almost exactly five trillion, and then it continued. That. Yeah, incredible, huh? And it continued to grow. Yep. You know, we went from fifteen to twenty very quickly, and it has continued to grow. We're now at twenty-two trillion dollars of excess cash. That <laughs> that primes the pump. I mean, the pumps are primed. People have money. Uh, companies have money. Everybody has money. Um, this is income. And now this is income, including all those transfer payments. This is household income, personal. And you can see it dipped just a tiny bit. Here come the transfer payments, up goes the income. But even after the transfer payments have passed and gone away, just regular old earned income is way above where it was in 2019. So even is though this, there's- go Is ahead. this inflation adjusted at all, or this is just in- This is a simple trend line, yep. this is a simple trend line. But we definitely have- uh, more income coming in now than we had in 2019. Um, right. Even though there's quite a few people not working, uh, we still are earning quite a bit more than we were. And everybody knows what happened with net worth. Uh, we, we, we show it every time. You know what happened to your house. Everybody knows what happened to their house. Everybody knows what happened to their 401k plan. It's up, up, <clears> up. So you had this massive spike. We've never had a, a, a spike this dramatic at this rate in, in net worth. But you just add up liquidity, cash reserves, um, income, and net worth, you have the dry powder, and it tends to lead to huge demand increases. And that's sorry. Let's hop back one. Sorry. Yep. So when when uh, just land land the plane a little bit for us uh, in terms of like when we see something in the stock market. Um, so you're you're saying the the net worth of the U.S. You know, 145 trillion. So when we see the S and P come down, you know, 10 percent, or you know, S and P, Dow, Nasdaq, everybody comes down 10 percent. What does that do? to net worth in the US? Is that um, 10 trillion? Is that 20 it, trillion? No, it, it, it definitely takes it down. You remember a huge portion of net worth in the United States is real estate. Yep. In the average household, it's probably not the average person on this phone call, but the right. average household, the their home equity is more than their financial assets. So um, it's not the, the stock market is not going to be half of this. It's going to be less than half. Um, I could find it for you later on. It's probably if it's probably it's, 50 or 60 trillion yeah. of it. But, you know, a 10 percent, 10 percent downturn. Still a big number. <laughs> still right. a big number. You know, in right. a few weeks, you have our nation loses five or six or seven trillion dollars in value. 
um, it's a pretty big number. But in aggregate, um, it's not enough to put anybody back even close to where they were in 2019. And, even with and, all this, everything that's happened, everyone is still way, way above where we were pre-COVID. Um, pretty wealthy. We're all pretty wealthy. And that's all around the world. That's everybody. And it causes these gigantic spikes in demand. It just, this is just one, this is PPI final demand. There's, there's many, many different ways to measure demand and there's different demand indices. This is uh, producer prices. This tends to be industrial demand. And you can see it's just skyrocketed um, because we started buying goods. We couldn't buy services, right? The services were shut down. We started hitting the Amazon button and buying and buying and buying. So demand for goods just absolutely skyrocketed. So hopefully we want this to taper off and as those services demands go up and we start going to restaurants and, and theaters again and it balances out a little bit. But in aggregate, demand went up way faster then we had the ability with labor to, to feed it. So now we have, that's why we have all these supply shortages everywhere. Uh, we end up with these supply chain issues. Um, and it, it, it's pinching everybody. It looks like it's getting better, but there's a, this is a pretty simple way to illustrate what happened um, with supply chain issues. You, you just look at inventories. Um, they always dip after a recession. That's not an unusual thing at all. You'll see they, they drop during and after a recession. That's to be expected. It's just this time they dropped a lot more. Mm -hmm. They just dropped a lot more than they typically did. And then with all the labor problems we had, where we typically would um, get some type of order backlogs, that's not unusual either because inventories are low. You're going to have order backlogs right after a recession. We just had a more severe one this time because the supply dropped more uh, than we've seen it before. Demand for goods increased faster and labor disappeared. So we had just had these gigantic backlogs that we're trying to work our way out of. And it looks like it's getting slowly a little bit better. But it drives right through, we've been talking about it all the way through, people increase prices. Prices of everything goes up. This is one of the more extreme examples. Um, look at the Freitos index of what it costs to float something from China to the US West Coast. Um, this is not an exaggeration. You could, do a, you, could take, you could float a container from China to the United States for $1,500 before the crisis, and now it's $15,000 to float a container across. So it's just one good example of how crazy some of the backlogs and the supply chain issues have gotten and it pushes through and it hits us all. Um, yeah, and so what I think what we generally know from uh, kind of fixed output or fixed bandwidth systems, uh, right, is that they, uh, as quickly as this goes up, you know, I think it, it can come down. The problem is you have to fix the, uh, the constraint. And I just, I. I'm still up in the air on whether we can fix that constraint in the next couple of years with how strong consumer demand is. And so that's, that to me is what's still worrying about this is, you know, you would hope that it goes, you know, comes up to 15 and then it comes back down to uh, 15 grand, but, and then down back down to 1500. Um, what, do you have an opinion on that? Do you think we'll, we'll be out of the woods before the end of the year? Or are you at? For, or not 1500 by the end of the year, probably. I tell you the thing that's encouraging on that is, you know, they do know if you look at some of it, a lot of it, there was a ton of durable goods purchasing, which is um, big items, automobiles, uh, refrigerators, durable goods like that. You're not going to continue to repeat large durable goods transactions year after year after year. So a lot of those things that caused this big backlog, thing, things that would have been made in China and delivered across the, the ocean, um, you're going to do that once during a limited period of time, and then it's probably four or five years again before you repeat those same kind of purchases. So some of that goods demand will naturally just taper off. Um, it just wouldn't make sense that we'll keep buying those same things over and over and over. So j just sort of the natural economics of it, it should be going our way. So the, the, the flow of new orders should stop and it should taper off and allow some of these backlogs to clear. You know, you get into the other things of how quickly will we get workers and, you know, the, the dock workers in California there to unload the tankers and load them on the trucks and enough drivers on the trucks to get the things moving this way. That's not likely probably to correct itself within the next nine months. Um, right. that, that may take longer, but the demand part of it should taper off so that it is, it's getting better. It should be getting better as we go through the second half of the year. Yeah. Uh, that'd be my best answer on that. And we're, and we're seeing we're seeing similar so a couple of points on that so Jordan wrote in the uh, in the chat uh, he's actually seeing you know up to seventeen going from um, uh, from China to uh, to door in in Texas and we're seeing um, you know this obviously is a is a China to U S West Coast uh, measure yeah. 
but we're, we're seeing similar stuff even into, into Houston, uh, into Norfolk, into, you know, East Coast. We're seeing, you know, even, um, you know, we have a, a customer in, on the Catfin side uh, that is shipping from Brazil. And they're still seeing, you know, it's not it's not quite 10x, but it's still, you know, six to eight, right? So this is acute around the world. It's not it's not just a China thing. Um, and I, I'm with you. I don't think you can work through a fixed bandwidth system with, you know, that really needs capacity really quickly. I mean, these these giant uh, container ships. I mean, they take three years to build. Yep. Right? So it's this is this is not going to be a short run thing. So I think we need to those of us that are exposed to this, we need to get used to it to an extent. Um, and uh, and try to get ahead of it. I think you're exactly right. We're in the camp that is going to be getting better, mm -hmm. but it is not going to be back to where we were anytime soon. Right. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna be a slow thaw coming out of this thing. Um, we'll get there eventually, but it's it's a challenge. There's no doubt about it. Um, we'll go also through one of the other contributors to this is stimulus, and then how it's all tied into inflation. Um, Chris already hit on it earlier. You know, that $5 trillion that we saw dropped in and it built all that liquidity, the, the tough longer term part of the story is, is that how do you measure that? Well, that's government debt. It was all deficit spending. They opened up the spigots. We were already in deficit. They said we need $5 trillion more. They just printed the debt. So we, we ballooned our government debt to do this. And you can see right here during the recession, we had this $5 trillion increase in, in government debt. And since then, it has continued to climb and climb and climb. Uh, because we are planning on being in deficit as far as the eye can see. When the Congressional Budget Office, we call it the SIBO, when they do their forecasts of where they're going to be over the next 5, 10, 15 years, all the way out, they show us being in a deficit, no matter what. So this number is just going to keep growing. Um, it's only important relative to the size of our economy, though. It's okay for your total debt to grow if your economy is growing. That's okay. Um, that's what you see on this chart. This is debt to GDP, which is how we measure countries. Um, and you can see down over here on the left-hand side, it wasn't growing, 15, 16, 17. Debt was growing, but the economy was growing at the same rate. So the debt to GDP ratio was staying constant, and that's just fine. But we hit the recession, 5 trillion gets blown up. The GDP is going down and debt is skyrocketing. Well, debt to GDP skyrockets. We had 130%. It's tapered back off now that the economy has recovered. We're sitting here, let's just call it 125% debt to GDP, roughly. Um, and we're slated to stay there and climb from there. Um, and I always get asked, you know, so what, whatever, uh, we've been here before. We have been here before once. We've been at this level once, and it was the end of 1945, when we finished fighting World War II, we funded that, and then we were gearing up to rebuild the rest of the world. We hit this level, and then from there, we went straight down because we stopped the deficit spending and our GDP took off and our debt to GDP ratio plummeted back to more normal levels. We are not planning on doing that this time. The, the plan this time around is that ratio, debt, that debt ratio is just gonna keep going higher and higher and higher. That's just, that is the plan, is, is we're gonna use that and, and we're gonna live with it. So what do you, what do you see as it, as it taking to, uh, uh, to get austerity to push this, this ratio down? Man, austerity is, uh, it seems like it is dead and gone. Um, yeah. There are That's very right. few um, countries. There are very few politicians. There's very few places anywhere in the world that anyone is willing to talk about austerity, meaning cutting back spending to get your spending back in balance and reduce your debt ratios. That's what Chris is talking about. Mm -hmm. um, that's not even being discussed pretty much anywhere. Every country, uh, the, the big G7, all the developed countries, they all, they all have very similar debt ratios or worse, and they're all planning on pushing them higher. So it's the new game. Everybody's going to live in the world above 100, and we're going to push them higher, and we are going to uh, leverage the future on the assumption that interest rates don't get too high. Um, if To be fair, if I had one of those economists on the phone with us right now, that, that is in support of this. And there are, there are some reputable economists that, that, that will build a case for this. And they will say that they have the math and the charts and the graphs. As long as our cost of our debt stays below our nominal GDP rate, that we will always be okay. And remember our real GDP rate, let's say it's two and a half or three, that's, act, that's after inflation. So our nominal GDP rate is four or five or six. And the cost of our debt is, you see it on TV, 2%, something like that, two and a half. 
So they would say that they can build the math that shows this is just fine as long as those relationships stay in place. That's why the inflation thing is so scary because if, infl if rates have to rise dramatically to take care of that, to stop the inflation, then all that convenient math that says this is all fine, that math gets a lot more challenging. But for now, uh, this is just the world we're going to live in. It just is what it is. And, and that's what's concerning to me is the, uh, is the, the one, two of both inflation and increased debt, because that's yep. where it could get. That's where it could get uh, dicey. It's a big experiment, and everyone in the world is doing it at the same time, and so it's a really, right. really big experiment. It's a really big experiment. Yep, it's the big one. It's the big one. It's it's like a 150, 200 trillion dollar experiment, and uh, we shall see. We shall see. Maybe they will be correct, and and it will all work out just fine. If you get a serious inflation problem that pushes rates a lot higher, uh, they're going to be on TV talking about it a lot. <laughs> A whole lot. A whole Let's lot. put it that way. Um, so you add all that together, you know, increased use of debt, tons of liquidity, income, demand, labor problems. It's driving these inflation numbers. Everybody's seen these are already a little higher than when I put this slide together. Um, headline inflation is up above seven. If you add them all, these are just three different variables of inflation. It's up around 6%, let's just say, on average. Um, broad inflation is up and it's much higher than the Fed wants. The Fed wants it right here where it was in the last decade at 2%. That's where they want it. It's a lot higher than that, and it's going higher. That's why they're talking about raising rates. Um, everybody knows there's some crazy places out there. I mean, I think we showed this last time. Everybody knows the used cars have gone just bonkers. Um, we've, we've seen used cars up 40% year over year. Um, it is believed that that, is, that will have to drop down because it can't continue. That, the, that, that we've already hit the pricing on used cars that will price them out of the realm of, of even possibility for people, that this could only be like a one-time shift. Um, are the prices going to go down? That's a harder one. They should stop going up. So next year, you're not going to have another 40%, but they may just be at zero, meaning they may be at the same place. They may have done a, a shift up that just sticks. And so some people may be surprised that the prices don't all come crashing back down. Um, they should stop spiraling upwards, though. They really should. Yeah, this one, this one's really concerning to me because I think when you look at a, um, when you look at the uh, the socioeconomically disadvantaged, the yep. um, the portion of income that goes towards things like car is uh, much higher. And then when you look at the cars that um, uh, you know, just cursory research online, the ones that are that are going up the most, it sees it's typically kind of more economy, you know, mm -hmm. type cars. And so this is, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, those of us that are on this call, you know, 7%, 10% inflation, like, yeah, that's no, that's no fun. Nobody is enjoying that. But when you look at those that are, that are making considerably less or near the, the poverty line, this could be a, a real recipe that, uh, for disaster yeah. for them. It's tough. My daughter is, um, I don't know if I told you last time, my daughter is an ICU nurse. She's a first year ICU nurse at research here in Kansas city. Um, young nurses don't get paid very much. Uh, they, they work by the hour. Right. Um, she doesn't have a bad job. There's, I'm not complaining. She does not have a bad job, but she is not a highly paid person at all. And she has a very old jalopy that she mm -hmm. is clunking around town in. And it scares me to death because she cannot afford to replace it. She cannot. Now, can she afford to go buy a tiny little, you know, econo box, you know, scary car? She, yeah, she can, she will be able to find wheels, but she cannot replace the car that she has. And when she does, she has to pay four dollars a gallon to gas it up, and it's it's brutal on her. It really is. So I mean, I'm watching her go through it, and it's it's tough to watch. Um, this thing does need to solve itself because we're a very car based country. Right. We're an automobile focused country. You can't really do anything in most places if you don't have wheels of some type that will get you somewhere. And and this is a real threat to uh, the the lower the lower rungs of society for sure. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's um, the markets are telling us, this is another odd thing that's going on. And this is a thing called inflation expectations. Um, this is embedded in the markets and the financial markets. You can trade inflation forward rates and in trade inflation futures. You can do that. And the inflation future expectations are telling us that five years forward, the market is expecting the average inflation is going to stay around 2%. You can see it barely got above two during all this, and it's been falling lately. So the financial markets are saying that inflation is a big problem now, but it is going to be falling off dramatically over the next five years, which is a real conundrum. The Fed follows this number very, very closely. 
And that's why um, they, they were so really relaxed about it all. They're saying, hey, inflation is not really a problem. It's going to be interesting to see if the market switches on this, because if this switches, if this number of the inflation expectations trading starts to drive higher, that's when bond rates and treasury rates move higher. And that's when mortgage rates start to move higher. And that's the kind of thing that can really impact activity. So we're hopeful that this sticks in here and doesn't move a whole lot. So it doesn't uh, cause a bunch of turbulence. Okay, we're getting to the tough part um, right here towards the end. We, I dropped in this stuff just in the last couple of days. All of the sudden, we have now just a uh, dumpster fire of geopolitical risk uh, that we've all gotten to deal with. And uh, it's a tough one. We know what's going on. Um, Russia is putting this, the, the heavy move on Ukraine. Everybody's hearing all about it. Um, the primary thing at this point in time, and, I, and there, there, well, there's two things, to be fair. The human, the human impact of this is horrific. It's, it's awful. You know, the families that are impacted by this and stuck in those areas, it's, it's horrible, horrible, horrible. Everything about it. There, there's no doubt about that. Economically, if we just talk about economically, the primary thing is probably that it, it impacts inflation and this inflation scare uh, a little bit longer. And we'll just try to show why we would say that. Um, this is a little comparison. On the left, the United States is 25% of global GDP. Uh, it's pretty easy to suss out how it all works. It's, it's the US, China, Japan, and the European Union are the four, roughly 25% each, close to it. You know, they, they're, all, they're not exactly 25, obviously, because there's more countries in there. But the United States is 25% of GDP, Russia is 1.8% of global GDP, and the Ukraine is 0.2. They are very, very small economic players in the global economic stage. They, they just are. Um, Russia is three-tenths of 1% of U.S. exports, and we import from Russia 0.7% of our imports come from Russia. Our direct exposure to Russia is very low. It's very low. Um, you all know the story, gas and energy exports to Europe. Russia is huge in exporting gas and energy to Europe. So um, in the short run, it's not a direct economic risk to the United States. Um, it's, a, it's a potentially really serious risk to Europe. And does that become a domino um, that, that works its way through? Um, at the risk of sounding um, callous, X out the horrible human part of this. Um, economically, these types of things tend to not have a lasting impact. Um, economically, this is a table of, of many of the most recent things that happened. And this is a simple measure of economics. Look at the S&P 500. Um, start, start with the Gulf War. You know, During the early days of the Gulf War, the stock market was still up. And three months after the start of the Gulf War, the S&P 500 was up 20%. It seems hard to believe, but it's true. 9-11, um, in those first few weeks, right after, kind of like what we're experiencing now, is down 11%. We're down around 10% right now from the peak. Three months after the inception, after 9-11-01, the S&P 500 was up 18%. You go all the way down the stack and you just look at the averages. On average, these horrible geopolitical events, we typically are down during them. And we're typically up quite dramatically three months later. Um, that is because in the modern era, most of these geopolitical events tend to be very regionally located and very regionally focused. And they tend to not um, cascade out into a global economic impact. Um, Russia is a pretty small economy. Um, Ukraine is a very small economy. If it plays out as it normally does, like it did in Crimea not too long ago, um, you can see right here, this happened with our good friend, Mr. Uh, Putin here just in 2014. Um, if it plays out and is, and is contained regionally, it should, not, it should not domino into a global economic slowdown. It should not. Um, we're in the camp that that's probably the most likely outcome. Are we 100% sure of that? Absolutely not. Um, are we 70% sure of that? We, I'd say 70 is probably a fair number. You, do you have a, a reasonable, uh, anytime you have a person that has nuclear weapons in their possession that is becoming aggressive, you have a chance that it could turn into a global economic event. It's not the most likely outcome. So 
Yeah, we're but, still in the marginally optimistic that this will play out kind of like all of our previous experiences. And it will three or four or five months from now, we'll be looking back on it saying, hey, thank God that was over um, and not having been terribly impacted by it. I'll pause there. Are there a thousand questions on that one? Uh, not yet. So I think uh, to me, the, the where this goes really wrong Right. Is if uh, a, a couple things come to mind is if we have some any type of you know, nuclear weapon fired. Oh, right? sure. Like that, it goes really wrong after that. And then the other thing you know, is if if China goes from kind of a, you know, um, uh, just not very vocal or not terribly supportive, you know, just kind of, you know, under the uh, under the surface supportive to uh, of Russia. To uh, to overtly right because um, I think mm -hmm. once uh, totally hear you on you know it's we're we're talking about <clears> two percent <throat> of the world's GDP that won't go to zero um, I do think there's some you mentioned it some shocks that could occur you know uh, in terms of energy uh, you know going towards uh, the European Union and and maybe a domino effect there. But if if China gets really aggressive, you know, then you've got you know twenty percent of the world's GDP and twenty five percent, you know, supporting two warring areas that could get that could obviously get yep. kind of nasty. But you have any view on on likelihood of that? Yeah, that's the new Cold War that we'd be we'd be back to nineteen eighty five again. You know, it'd be it'd be China and Russia against the rest of us, and that would be very bad indeed. Um, yeah, our our best guess on that is that we. More so China, but you would you would think Russia, but Mr. Putin's behavior is is indicating uh, less so. But China, we know they have become increasingly more westernized in the last ten or twenty years. They have become increasingly more capitalist. They're sort of a a hybrid communist capitalist system, and they have so much more to lose now than they have had in the past. And their people expect so much more in terms of standard of living. And those kind of things, it seems that it's less likely that China wants to become involved in an actual conflict like the bad old days in 1988. Um, our best guess is that they do not want that. Uh, they, they've, they've, they're very Western now, they're very capitalist now, and they do not want to go way back. Um, Russia, you would think the same thing too, uh, but, he, but less so. Um, Mr. Putin seems to not care too much. He, he seems to be willing to risk it all uh, to do these things. We're, so we're in the camp that China is not likely to want to throw in and get back into the, to the old uh, 1988 type of a situation. Um, it is, it's a $100 trillion question, though. If, yeah. if they do, if they formally align, it's, it's going to be a, a real challenge, a real, real, real serious challenge. Again, we, we think that's a 30% likelihood, not a, not a 55 if we thought that was a 50 or a 55, we would be getting much, much more defensive. Uh, we think it's well less than 50% likelihood at this time. Um, despite the fact we know even here, we're feeling the pinch here. I mean, this is U.S. average gas prices. I mean, average gas prices at the pump now basically four bucks. So we're, we're already feeling the impacts from some of this, despite the fact that we, that we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of dependence on them. Um, Solutions, and this is not to the Russia problem. This is to the inflation problem, folks. Uh, take away the punch bowl. Um, the punch bowl's been out. We've had free money, and the Fed's getting ready to do that. They're going to start raising rates, taking away the punch bowl. Um, that is one solution to calming down some of the demand and the inflation we have out there. Turning off the stimulus, we already talked about it. They're going to probably leave it off. They've turned it off, and they're going to leave it off. Uh, the supply chain issue, as Chris already talked about, um, boats and trucks are a tougher one. There, there are some tough regulations around which trucks can go where. Um, trucks out of Mexico cannot tr drive in the United States, so they have to unload and pass them off to a United States truck to move mm. them around. I mean, things like that could maybe be moved around to help solve this, to keep things moving a little better. But regulation is also a thing that's very slow to change. Very, very slow. Um, so and we wish... Go ahead. Fed accommodation. What are, what are you thinking? Um, what do you think in the first Fed meeting or the, the March Fed meeting is going to yield? Are he you was out. To, uh, he was out talking today. Uh, yeah. Mr. Powell came out and talked today, and he calmed people down a little bit. He 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 never says anything overtly, but he indicated that he is not in favor of a fifty basis point tightening in March. Everyone was saying it's going to be fifty for sure. He said he's not in favor of that. They're looking at twenty five, and then they're going to 
watch things and be careful and cautious and see what they need to do. And which is kind of his job is what he said They're They're not going to come out guns blazing. That's for sure. Which I think is a good thing. They're going to move slowly. Probably uh, they'll probably do their first move next week, but yeah, it'll well, probably just be 25 and then they'll take their time and see what happens. Why do you say it's, it's a good thing to come not come out guns blazing to me? I would shock, I mean, obviously I'm not on a Fed board, but I would try to shock the system a little bit and say, no, no, we're in control. We've got this. Right. Thing versus, yeah. you know, I would say you're exactly right, Chris. If I'd say X, what just happened with Russia? Got it. If, yep. if the Russian thing had not happened, they'd be doing 50 next week. Yep. They come out with a little shock and awe and really get after it. But because of this whole global uncertainty thing and people are seeing these awful, awful images on YouTube and, sure. you know, yeah. And so the uncertainty and the psychology of it is so volatile right now. Um, they have to be sensitive to that and they don't want to come out like a bull in a China shop in the middle of that and then cause a bunch of people uncertainty about interest rates and the Fed and the markets. And oh, my God. So it, the, the Russia has caused them to have to step back and tap the brakes a little bit. And I think that's the right thing for them to do until this Russian thing calms down a little bit, or at least the shock over the Russian thing calms down a little bit. Uh, we will get desensitized to that over time. And that's another kind of dark side of these confrontations, three or four or five weeks out, we start to desensitize to the story. And um, that's, that's one of the things that happens. Um, I'm gonna move quickly through this last section. Um, we know that some people thought the equity markets were a little out of balance anyway, coming into this. I mean, this is uh, PE valuations. We were way up around 22, which was very, very high. It has spiked up after um, the recession during that big run up of, of asset prices. It has slowly been correcting itself now. So that imbalance has started to basically fix itself. Uh, equity valuations are down around 18 now, which is a good thing. So this sell off was probably healthy for us to get valuations back to a more normalized level. We all know what's happened to home prices. Everyone has seen it in their neighborhood and everywhere around them. Houses sell before they get listed, uh, 100,000 over asking price. It's, it's everywhere you turn. And prices went up 18%, to just call it 20% year over year. Um, that is probably going to continue to be a pretty spicy number. It's probably not going to be 20% again next year, but it may be another 10% next year because the supply of new homes is at an all-time low relative to the number of households in the United States. We just can't put the homes up. They can't get the lumber and they can't get the builders. They can't put them up fast enough. Um, so the home prices are not at all likely to come down from here. They're going to keep going up, but probably at a much lower rate. Uh, they just can't get the homes built fast enough. Yeah, um, I agree with that one. There's, if you look at the math from the Great Recession, where we basically gutted all home building, yep. to now, there's something like a four million dollar or four million home sh shortage in the it's, U.S. It's, it's bad. Really acute. Yep. It's really bad. We have a lot of large commercial relationships with big developers and builders, and they're just like, it's going to take us two years to catch up with the backlog of on home demand. Longer. I think yeah. it's, it's stabilization is probably. 10 or 15 out. I mean, obviously we're not going to have 10% per year, right? Because at some point the payments get too big for people, but low yep. prices plus this shortage, I think we got a long way to go. On I have a good buddy who uh, sold his house. He sold, oh, this is stupid. I'm selling my house. I'm moving into an apartment. I'm going to buy it back when my house is down 30%. Yep. And I said, good luck to you, friend, because I don't think that's happening. He's going <laughs> to buy his, I think he's going to buy his house back when it's up another 20% from where he right. sold it. Um, that's a chance. Um, real yields were just too low. This is, this is interest rates minus inflation. They're yeah. deeply negative and the Fed needs to correct that because it's really, it's too cheap to borrow money right now. Yeah. And so they're working on that. That's why they're going to raise rates. And they, they, it's why they really do need to raise rates. It's not a bad thing that they're going to be raising rates. Money's just a little too cheap. Yeah. So we'll finish right at the top of the hour with our forecast. Um, we know what happened with the economy in 20 and 21. Uh, 2022, even with Russia, if there's some kind of a slowdown because of oil and energy and all that, we should still at least put up 3.5% for 2022, even with, with uh, this oil thing lasting all year long. So it's still going to be a good year. And we think next year around two and a half or two, two is still a great year. So we're still optimistic um, that everything's going to do well. Um, we have in our forecast still, even with the sell-off we've experienced so far this year, we still have a seven to 10% return on equities by the time we get to the end of the year. We think this is going to turn out like all those other geopolitical cycles that we've seen in the past, because the economy here in the United States is still doing quite well. And so we think we'll have a good growth uh, trajectory. 
bond market already talked about it. The Fed's going to still move four or five times. They're just going to be a little softer in their verbiage around it. We think money markets will get up to one and a quarter, one and a half at the end of the year. And the 10 year is going to move just slowly up to maybe two and a quarter. So higher rates, but not high enough to disrupt anything. We, we don't think it's anything for anybody to be afraid of. It'll help the Fed maybe start tapping the brakes on inflation, but it shouldn't shut down the economy at all. Um, so summary is GDP 3.8, maybe 3.5 if Russia lasts a little bit too long. Unemployment rates still falling because people are hiring anybody that, that can walk and chew gum at the same time they're hiring them. So unemployment rate goes down to 3.2, Fed funds up to 1.5. Great news because cash and money markets will pay 1.5. That won't be bad when that happens. Uh, 10 year trade two and a quarter, like I said, SP 500, 7 to 10. Um, that's it. That's all I have. Is there anything else we need to cover? We finished right at the top of the hour. Yeah. So I think we had, um, uh, okay. I think so. Scott's asking about uh, if, and I think this is linked to Russia. You know, obviously we know that, you know, a considerable portion of, uh, of cyber attacks that we're seeing, you know, coming out yeah. of uh, kind of, you know, more rogue states like Russia, North Korea, places like that. Any, any concerns that this goes from not just a physical war, but to a, a, a larger cyber war? Yeah, and, I, and I'll throw you out there a, a, a preamble to that. Um, a lot of folks are talking about how in history, um, even during the worst parts of the different wars, we never shut off the energy pipeline from Russia. The energy always kept flowing because it was so important to everybody. This time, we have shut off the banking to Russia. Right. You got a big risk that if, if Russia can't access the funds that are paying them for all that energy that's still flowing to Germany and everywhere else, will they shut the pipeline off? And then things get ugly in Europe. Um, or does the fact that they cannot access banking because they've shut down their global banking lines, um, does it all increase with the sanctions and maybe the loss of their banking revenues? Does it increase the likelihood that the cyber attacks increase? That's almost certainly a yes. Yeah. I don't know how you could rationally say no to that. Right. And we know that they're good at it. Um, they've been behind a couple of the big ones in the last couple of years. Um, we absolutely have to expect to hear some crazy things coming on the cyber front. We just do. I, I don't know. Would you disagree? No, I, I think that's well reasoned. I, I thought that was a great question. I hadn't even thought of it. Like, of course, you think about you know, Russia and cyber, but in terms of it kind of moving away from just you know, physical. And I think that's a great point on when you shut off somebody from the banking system, uh, it's generally problematic. I think the one thing that's, that is going here is uh, the wealth in Russia is really concentrated. I mean, when you talk about the yeah. oligarchs, uh, it's, it's a very, you know, we think that wealth is concentrated here in the U.S. and certainly historically that, that is correct today. Uh, but it's very, very concentrated in Russia. And so maybe they can persist for a bit without, uh, you know, just under, hopeful, hopefully understanding this is a temporary thing until Putin uh, uh, you know, grabs his mind. So uh, you know, if he <laughs> grabs his mind, if, if ever, right? Yeah, hopefully that's what, you know, I think that's what we all pray for is, I mean, it's, it's nasty. So that's a good point. It probably yeah. is, it probably will increase it. <clears throat> Cannot be surprised. I mean, people should absolutely just emotionally be ready to hear, oh Lord, some system has been shut down. Don't, um, yeah, don't click that down. link. Yeah, be very <laughs> careful. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, Kristen, well, I, I Eric, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead, Aaron, wrap us yeah, up. Yeah, thank you so much. I think this has been a really incredible discussion. Um, I love that we touched on how everything's affecting individuals at a personal level, but I know our suppliers are really interested to see and hear where it's gonna affect their business. And so I really appreciate both of you attending. I think we had great questions from the attendees. So thank you. Um, just to everyone who's attending, we'll be sending an email out with um, the recording as well as the opportunity to link with Chris and Eric if you have more questions. So thank you everybody and have a great Wednesday afternoon. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. See you all. Thank you. See you.